We're in the end game now. Now you may have seen a load of stuff in the news about how curves are flattening and it's almost all over and we can get back to life as normal. No, almost nothing has changed. Almost everyone in society still has no immunity to the virus and it's just as contagious as it was a month or so ago. At the moment, all this quarantine stuff has just kind of slowed down the fuse on the viral time bomb. In fact, what we've seen isn't really even the tip of the iceberg as to what a real pandemic would look like. I mean, the tip of the iceberg is typically about 10%. We've only seen about 1% of what a real pandemic from this virus would look like. Let's just take the US numbers as an example. There are about a third of a million confirmed cases of the virus in America. So that would be about 0.1% of Americans have been confirmed to have this virus. Now, I'm going to be generous here and say that those numbers are much smaller than they are in reality. That is, that the real numbers are probably there's something like 3 million Americans who actually have this virus, and only a third of a million of them have actually been confirmed as having it. Now, that would mean that about 1% of America has actually got this virus. And from that, we also know, if you've been following the numbers, that America is approaching its peak number of deaths per day, which is about 3,000 per day. So if you just let this thing rip through your society such that it infects 100% of Americans, you would be looking at a peak death toll per day about 100 times bigger than it is at the moment. That's about 300,000 per day. That's comparable to the entire American death toll from World War II. But whatever, let's just stick with the 1% of Americans have actually been infected by this virus for the moment. A few weeks of quarantine has scarcely taken the edge off this. If America decides that, yep, we stopped the virus, time to go back to business as normal, the virus will simply eat through the remaining 99% of the country that has no immunity to it. And seeing as the viral infections double about every three days, that means that, means that in about 10 days, you have an order of magnitude. You are only looking at about 20 days of business as normal until the entire country is infected, peaking out at some 300,000 dead per day ish. They're crude numbers, but they're in the right ballpark. They're no longer really hypotheticals. We know that about 1% of America is infected with this virus, and we know the peak deaths per day is about 3,000 per day. Cool, so we suspended the economy of the country for about a month. I'll come back to if that's financially worth doing at the end of this video. What does that get you? Well, the uncontained viral spread rate is about 1.3. That is, the average person spreads it to well, one third of an extra person per day. That's the wild spread rate. Now, by all these quarantine measures, you get that spread rate down. And if the rate goes to one, then there's no more viral spread. So how are countries around the world doing at getting that number down? Well, these are the numbers for Italy and for the United States. So how low do you have to get those numbers and for how long before you can say that it's safe again? Well, you know, if someone gets the virus, they're contagious for about mm, two weeks-ish. So after two weeks, Mr. Infected goes to being Mr. Clean or Mr. Dead. Either way, he doesn't have the virus anymore. So in the wild spread case, where the spread rate is 1.3, Mr. Infected will infect about 40 people before he becomes Mr. Clean. So the minimum amount that you need to get this number down to is such that Mr. Clean only infects one extra person in the two weeks where he's infectious. Now, it turns out that that number is a spread rate of about 1.055. This is the red line. If you're below the red line, it's only a matter of time before the virus is beaten. And if you're above the red line, it's only a matter of time before everyone is infected. So this is the end game. You have to get the spread rate below the red line until there is no more virus. Now, if you start getting complacent that, well, there are hardly any cases now, why should I worry? Well, that's fine. You're just going to increase the spread rate in your society. If it creeps up enough, well, sorry, you're going to have to go through the whole month shutdown thing again. 
all take the hit of the virus running through your civilization. In fact, this is probably the thing that worries me the most. What fraction of your society has to not take this seriously before it's impossible to get below the red line? And so I'll just give you the answer. If one person in six thinks that the virus is a hoax or it's caused by 5G or, or they've just got to go to work to pay the bills or there's been some miracle cure for the coronavirus and so you don't have to worry about it anymore or they've had enough of experts, doesn't matter what the reason is, they have the wild spread rate. And if the remaining five-sixths of society behave absolutely perfectly such that they don't spread the virus to anyone, you still, in that society, you cannot contain the spread of the virus. When you reopen society, you must stay below the red line. And honestly, having looked at the numbers, I've got doubts as to if that's possible or not. When only one-sixth of the population can destroy the work of the remaining five-sixths. I mean, it's as simple as that. Getting over 80% of the population to agree and strictly adhere to anything is almost impossible. And this was one of the reasons why I did the video debunking the 5G causes coronavirus stuff. And it did okay, you know, pulled in somewhat over 100,000 hits. Meanwhile, people like David Icke are pushing the idea that there is no virus and are pulling in some four times the traffic. And if you use the likes as a barometer, his message is more convincing than mine. And that's why I have pause for concern if staying below the red line is even possible. And if you want to help, yes, you can share this video with as many people as you can. You know, share it on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, whatever. And Google, you know what would help if you hadn't purged a lifelong university research scientist who actually knows what he's talking about and has made the effort to get involved in this from your search engine. So here's my video on YouTube, 150,000 hits. Let's take my exact title and stick that into Google and see what comes up. And what you find is my video doesn't come up at all. Okay, let's do a search for videos with my exact video title. And again, it just doesn't exist. But hey, what's this? That looks like my video. Apart from no, that's not my video. That's someone like mirroring my video or embedding it into a website. My video doesn't appear at all. Well, maybe I wasn't specific enough. Let's put in Thunderfoot as well and see what that comes up with. And again, it's someone else's embedded my website. Uh, yeah, it's like I just don't exist at all on, <laughs> on Google. And, and for what? This was a scientist debunking the 5G causes coronavirus conspiracy. But setting aside Google memory holding me, the bigger picture here is that it's no longer that fake news stories are just a, a nuisance or some such or if people believe in miracle cures. Going forward in time, to view alternate futures, to see all the possible outcomes of the coming conflict. These folks don't just harm themselves during a pandemic. How many did you see? 14,605,000. They make it impossible to contain a pandemic. How many did we win? One. And for those who are wondering, is it worth taking the financial hit here of shutting down the country for a, a month or so? Well, here is a strict financial argument, one that is entirely disconnected from the three or so million people who would die if you pursued this strategy. And that's three million just for America. Yeah, and three million people, give or take, that's 10 times the number of Americans who died in World War II. So here I've got the years as they go by and the GDP of my country. So in the first instance, I'm just going to have, I start off with 100% GDP and it goes up about 3% per year. Very nice, good, solid growth. But we're going to have a pandemic in this year and we're going to shut down the economy for a month or two. And so the sort of effect that you expect off of that is, of course, a load of the small businesses go broke and it takes them a very long time. So when you emerge from the pandemic, your economy is in tatters. And so you'll have 
negative growth for a long time, lots of unemployed people, and eventually it'll, it'll hook around and start going back up again. So this is the worst case scenario. You lock down the country, loads of businesses go broke, you emerge from quarantine and your economy is in ruins. Worst case scenario. So let's see what happens if we sacrifice 10% of our economy now just to keep all the small businesses running. You know, just to keep everyone fed, everyone happy. It costs us 10% of our GDP, but for only one year. Then after that, it's basically you resume economic growth as normal, which is great. Now let's take a look what happens if we just say, whatever, we'll let 1% of the people die. So now, of course, you've lost 1% of the people. You've lost 1% of your GDP because those people were contributing to your GDP. You lose the people, you lose the GDP. So you're going to look something like this, that you basically lose 1% of your economy, but you've lost it basically in perpetuity. And so it turns out that losing 10% of your economy for one year is roughly the same as losing 1% of your economy for about 10 years. Now, of course, you know, when people are dead, they're dead for a lot longer than 10 years. So if you're looking about 10 years in the future, it turns out that sacrificing 10% of your economy is worth doing, not just ethically, but financially. So what you're going to do is just print a load of money. Devalues all the currency by about 10%. And you're going to give that money out to people such that they can keep their small businesses running like normal. In reality, of course, you've lost 10% of your GDP for this year. But when you emerge from quarantine, your economy continues as normal. Now, in America, the GDP is about $20 trillion and the bailout package is about $2 trillion. Eh, give or take the, you know, the value that America is going to lose by not working for one month. Now, the $2 trillion is actually quite a lot of money. That's $2,000 billion. Costs about a billion dollars to send a fancy rover to Mars. So the cost of this bailout is like sending six rovers to Mars per day for the next year. Or you could run NASA off it for the next 100 years. Or you can bring it a little closer to home. What's it going to cost you personally? Well... $2 trillion between 300 million Americans is about $7,500 for every man, woman, and child in America. What's your average American going to get out of it? Well, it looks like about $1,000. Whether the remaining $6,500 is going, I'm not entirely certain. But I can tell you these bailouts are comparable to other packages around the world. Now, I should stress that that $2 trillion dollars doesn't guarantee this outcome. It only gets you the admission to play the game. And it's only any good if it's distributed to the right people. You have to make sure that everyone who needs that compensation for their loss of salary gets it. You know, you need to make sure that your economy stays ticking over. You see, if that $2 trillion just ends up in the pockets of bankers or billionaires or people with lots of political influence or something, and you're relying on the, the trickle down you're wasting your time. The economy will be just as much in ruins by the time the quarantine is over as if you never implemented the aid package in the first place. The macro picture is still the same though. What you've got to do is you've got to cut the spread rate of the virus by getting people to stay at home. And they're not going to do that if they're getting sued for not paying their rent or they can't afford to buy food. So the government has a very short window to make sure that people get enough money to buy food, pay the rent, prop up the economy for at least a month. And this is where it gets kind of tricky. Speed and competence. A harsh test for any government. So that, my friends, is the end game. You've got to get the spread rate below 1.055 and keep it there when your country opens up again. The lower you get it, the shorter the end game will be. Vaccines would work fine, except we don't have one and we're not realistically going to have one for at least a year. And it typically takes about a decade of work or so to work out an effective treatment for a virus. The chances of you just having a drug on the shelf that inhibits the virus life cycle but doesn't affect you are kind of like finding a winning lottery ticket in your trash. It's not impossible, it's just it's never happened before. So until then, when your society opens up again, don't touch anything you don't have to. Wash your hands regularly, 
socially distance, face mask, sure, if only as a reminder not to touch your face. And let's make this as quick as possible. So many thanks for that. I'd be grateful if you share this video with your friends. A thumbs up would be nice, if only so I can match the approval rating of Conspiracy Nutters. Uh, Patreon links are below if you want to support this channel directly. I, I greatly appreciate those of you who support this channel that way. And I wish you luck for the end game.